Hey, what's going on? Um, I've been thinking about what to do for a new episode, and I saw some suggestions in the comments about picking apart. Why don't you pick apart one of your new songs on your new EP? You know what? That's a great idea because part of the reason I ended up making this EP completely on my own was because of the pandemic. Even my solo stuff always had guests and people helping me or co-producers. You know, most of the time I enjoy making music in a group setting, but uh, you know, that's just not easy to do right now. So I'm not gonna pick the first song because I already made a music video for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry about that. That's the verse guitar part. That's where this whole song started for me, was coming into my studio and just being like, I know I wanted to write something. I didn't want to start on drums. Sometimes I hear beats unloading the dishwasher. I will run into my studio and tap them out. It's kind of how Distorted Fields came about actually from um, last failure release. Back to this song, what sound do you want to start with? And for some reason, I just thought of this guitar. This is a 1976 Les Paul standard. Pretty sure I bought it in 94. I bought it before the recording of Fantastic Planet because we used it quite a bit on that record. I just feel like visiting the neck pickup on this Les Paul with like a cleaner, almost like acoustic-y, strummy, but with some hair and some honk. Let's go neck pickup, this guitar, Vox AC30. For guitar and bass sounds, for both in the studio and for live, I pretty much live inside a Fractal Audio Axe Effects these days. I pulled up a real simple amp and cab template. Let me just bypass these two effects so we can see what's going on with these two guys. So the cabinet is a 212 Bluto. I'm guessing that's an SM57 and it's in the A position. A little bit of proximity effect. Room is off and air is off. So. This is very dry. Well, let's look at the amp. Class A, 30 watt bright. It's um, a little plain, and I wish it was a little bit, just a tiny bit hairier. I'm gonna throw on a compressor pedal. I'm almost using it like a boost. If you can see here, there's a um, 4 dB uh, level boost. It's really only compressing two and a half, three dB. And it's also just driving the input of the uh, amp block a little bit harder. Here's without it. Go with it. Much different than a fuzz would be, more of like just a boost. And then I knew I just wanted to put in a phaser. Uh, <laughs> Who was making fun of me about liking phasers too much? It was a really good burn. I appreciated it. I do use phasers too much, probably. I love them, and I've loved them since I bought one of my vintage pedals, Mutron Phase. Not the bi-phase, just a, a single channel of phase, but it just has such an amazing tone, and that's all over Fantastic Planet, and I'm pretty sure that's what's going on here with this awesome sounding phaser built into the fractal. <laughs> Now, it's not very dramatic because I have the mix way down on purpose. I don't want it to be super dramatic. I just want it to give a little bit of slur, just a little bit of something, tiny bit of modulation um, during the rhythm part. It's barely there, really. Here's without it. And with it. The 
amount of it is really low. It's 20%. So here's 50%. <laughs> And now the phaser is like the thing about the sound instead of just being like, is there a phaser on it? It's hitting you over the head with I'm a phaser. And that is something that you really don't normally see on the actual hardware unit. Most pedals do not have a mix control. Some do, but uh, I would say most do not in the fractal Axe Edit USB Editor. I find myself in a lot of the patches that I make using pedal blocks with really low percentages is um, a really awesome thing that you really couldn't do uh, in analog world. So there's the sound. I mean, that's it. <laughs> responsive like you can be clean with the light touch and but it never gets really totally saturated Let's see if I can actually play along with the track just like that. All right, so that's the clean guitar sound and parts that go in this song, played on my 1976 Gibson Les Paul standard. Getting together with drummers and it's been tough, but if you're willing to put in the time, there's pretty cool drum sample libraries. This is a kit that I set up custom for this song using uh, this Really cool plugin called Superior Drummer 3 by TuneTrack, and it's just awesome. You got a lot of different libraries, but the great thing is, is you can mix and match between all of the libraries. It's a Premier kick drum, a Yamaha snare drum, Gretsch toms, Zildjian K crash there, Masterwork Jazz crash there, uh, Zildjian ride cymbal and zildjian k 14 inch hi-hats obviously i wanted a really kind of laid back dry what's great about this plugin is you can go over to the mixer window so you have an entire other it's almost like a sub mixer within your your daw pro tools in this case where you can mix your drum just using eqs and compressors and, and whatnot and reverbs that they have in here but they also have the kind of standard complement of drum mics that you would record if you were recording a real kit at a studio kick in kick out kick sub snare top snare bottom hi-hat rack tom i'm not using three rack toms i'm just using one and i'm just using one floor tom i am using overhead and a tiny bit of the ambient ribbon microphone which is like the room mic and i'm doing a tiny bit of 1176 style bus compression on the whole kit before it comes into pro tools you can do much more complicated workflows audio wise with this plugin if the song is more dense than this song it um, I might go ahead and print out everything separate as audio tracks, but in the composition stage, I try to keep it all MIDI so that I can, you know, edit the drum parts at will as I'm working on the song. And it just so happens that I was able to keep this MIDI the whole time. I actually found it to be really cool to have access to the MIDI during the actual mix. Like I could go in and adjust the velocities in a more detailed mindset of, of mixing, basically, and be working, um, you know, kind of one step early in the process on the drum sound for this song. Here's the kick track. You'll notice in the mix here for the kick drum sound, there's another mic that I'm not using at all, which is the uh, kick in, which has an attack on it, which would be really good for a slightly more aggressive uh, song, maybe with, you know, bigger and, and um, 
thicker distorted guitars but for this i wanted more that more kind of like easy going mellow thing so i just left that one completely out this snare five and a half by 14 yamaha copper nouveau i am tuning it down just a bit i've got a lot of bottom mic happening here Because the mic, the miking technique that they used for the bottom is stereo, and it's really cool, really, really cool. Gretsch Toms is a nine by thirteen rack. Not doing any pitching, not doing any pitching here. I mean, you can hear they are panned. Uh, the MIDI track that, uh, that has the most variation and I probably spent the most time on was the hi-hat track. I spent some time on the velocities. I mean, they're all still up relatively high. And then also you have the, you have the closed hits and the open hits for, for accents and stuff. Oh, and there's also that those ghost notes on those on the fills there. Just so you know, see how I'm doing that. Just have them really low. There's not a lot of variation. This is like a groove kind of you know hypnotic kind of thing. And for the most part, like I kept the pattern really simple, fairly static. Here is the ride symbol. When you hear this by itself. The sounds are good, but it does sound slightly unnatural because it's slightly too perfect, too quantized maybe. But what I find is if you have a kind of super tight drum track like this, the way that you inject feel into it, if you're doing stuff on your own and you know you're going to be playing the other instruments, especially the bass and rhythm guitars, that's where you can inject the feel into it and make it feel like, you know, it's a real band that's grooving. Drums by themselves you're not going to really hear that in this song you're going to hear other instruments playing with it so it's all relative right if the bass is a little ahead it's going to make it feel like the drums are behind if the bass is a little back it's going to make it feel like the drums are a little bit on top i just kind of know i'm going to make it feel more real when i lay down the other track so let's let's just move over to the bass for a second <laughs> All of a sudden it feels like there's some humanity in the in the rhythm section and that it's not just computer playing back MIDI notes. What's actually happening with the bass? I'm curious. Right about there is the beginning of the note. And it's pretty much right on the grid, right? Okay. But what's happening here? These are consistently behind those guys right there. That one's a little behind. Mm, I don't know. That one's considerably behind. So yeah, so the verse is consistently behind. Second thing that you might notice is that because the hits are slightly off between the kick drum and the bass, you actually end up hearing a little bit more of the tone and character of the bass. If it's all pushed further away from the drum hit itself, it has more room to speak. I don't think about trying to be late when I'm playing. I'm just trying to make it sound cool, feel cool. So the drums are on top, bass a little behind. Kind of a classic relationship, I think. So here we go. Crow's Eye Bass. This is patches even more simpler than the guitar was. There's no pedals. It's just an amp and a cab. Let's look at the amp first. And I'm doing nothing. I just pulled up a porta bass amp head. The only thing I did was pull down the input trim a little bit because it was just a little too grindy. We go over here and everything's muted except this third cabinet, which is a 210 Ampeg with a Royer 121 microphone. This whole part is very palm muted. Letting up on the string and palm muting to get this kind of Okay, so that's the bass sound. Um, let's see if we can't uh, play along with the track.
Okay, so that covers the bass guitar. Now, um, I'm starting to think this episode's getting a little long, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it into two. So on this episode, we've covered um, how the song started on guitar, um, the programming of the uh, MIDI drums with Superior Drummer 3, and then um, adding the bass guitar. And so we've covered the rhythm section for this uh, first half of Crow's Eye, and in the next episode, we'll have keyboards, vocals, and mixing. Okay, so thanks for watching, and stay safe. Later.